This episode of F1 Beyond the Grid is sponsored by Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3. Available now. I was so infatuated with just winning. And he's going to take him. He's through. Mario Andretti's superb passing manoeuvre. I never lacked desire. I never lacked desire. Oh, what great stuff. Mario Andretti has got it. A magnificent race he has driven. Passion and desire. I know that's what drove me. 45 years ago, that's what drove Mario Andretti to Formula One World Championship glory. But the 1978 season was tinged with grief. It should have been the happiest day of my career for sure, which was somewhere I could not celebrate. How could I celebrate? I lost one of my best friends. Hello and welcome to F1 Beyond the Grid with me, Tom Clarkson, as we look back at the season in which Mario Andretti achieved his life's ambition. Even when he was winning in IndyCar, driving in Formula One was always Mario's mission, and he started racing full seasons in Formula One in the mid-1970s. It was with Lotus, led by the visionary Colin Chapman, that Mario made his mark. A long list of champions had driven Chapman's innovative cars, and Mario took things to the next level, making changes to setup, to steering, and to suspension that had never previously been seen in Formula One. 45 years later, it's incredible how clearly he remembers every detail. Those setup secrets gave Mario and his Lotus an edge, and he needed every advantage he could get because his rivals in 1978 were among the strongest that have ever lined up for a Grand Prix. Nicky Lauda, Emerson Fittipaldi, James Hunt, Gilles Villeneuve, Jody Schechter and Alan Jones are just some of the legends he was up against. And then there was Ronnie Peterson, Mario's Lotus teammate and close friend, who died after a crash on the same weekend that Andretti became world champion. Mario's memories of that are still so strong. He's also got a few favourites among the current F1 grid, and he remembers the last time that Formula One raced in Las Vegas. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Mario, it is great to have you on the show again. How are you? Wonderful, thank you. Thank you for having me, by the way. You do look ridiculously well, it has to be said. You get younger <laughs> rather than older. <laughs> well, happy life. <laughs> Let's talk about something that happened 45 years ago. Of course, the 1978 World Championship, which you won. How do you reflect on that achievement now? If I'm ever depressed any time, I can just go back and start thinking about that situation, you know, how important it was in my life because... That was my original dream, to be a Formula One driver, and let alone winning a world championship. If you can imagine, 1965, Jim Clark won Indianapolis. I, I finished third, so obviously we had time to chat. You know, we were pretty much in a, <laughs> you know, uh, at a good place. And uh, when we were saying our goodbyes after the banquet, I said to Colin Chapman, I said, hey, Colin, someday I would like to do Formula One. And he said, Mario? When you think you're ready, I'll we have the third car for you. Now, can you imagine how I felt at that point? And then, so I went on and I, I lobbied like crazy to get uh, road races into IndyCar. When I drove midgets in 1963, there was one road race at Lime Rock, Connecticut, and I won that. And actually, it was uh, Mark Donahue that was driving, uh, built just for that race, a rear engine, offy, and uh, with a two-speed gearbox. And I beat him on the last lap because I only had one gear and I had to blow the engine before I got to the start-finish line because I was out of gear and there was no rev limiter. So all the valves just came out of the heads on that offy engine. But the point I'm making, you know, I, I was working up to that. The one thing that I wanted to do is, for instance, uh, uh, be part of the Ford Le Mans program because we had miles and miles of road racing for testing. And who did I befriend at that point? 
was Bruce McLaren. He and I became good buddies. And uh, I would just, you know, at, at night, at dinner and so forth, I would just pick his brain until he was, you know, <laughs> until he was ready to go to bed. And, uh, and, and it was so useful for me because he was such a technical driver. And then uh, here we go in 67, we win the 12 hours of Sebring with a new Mark IV Ford. And so 68, I called Colin and I said, Colin, I would like to do the last two races of the season. And he said, right. He says, I'll have a car for you. And then Watkins Glen was just, you know, I didn't expect this, you know, to be on pole and have Jackie Stewart next to me. You know, I was, uh, I was as surprised I mean, as anyone. It, it but was an extraordinary achievement to start your first Grand Prix on pole. I'm fascinated by what you said earlier about lobbying for more road races in IndyCar because was that early part of your career all about preparing yourself for Formula One? 100%. There was one problem, however. You know, we were earning so much more on IndyCar because of the, the tire testing and, 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 and all the, the, the tire war, if you will. You know, Goodyear and Firestone, and I was one of the drivers that was uh, contracted to Firestone, and, and uh, they wanted me in the States. And otherwise, I would have probably pursued Formula One since uh, 1970 at least, you know. And the guess who took my, my seat? Emerson Fittipaldi. To some degree, I regret that in that sense that I would have had, you know, a longer career than and Formula World One. Championships. And more Hopefully, you know, more, but at the same time, you know, I had to be realistic in, in some sense. You know, the sport was not enjoying the safety we're enjoying today. And I never dwelled on this, but I was losing friends left and right with families. I had a young family at the time, and I was trying to provide to the point that if something happens to me, at least they're cared for. That was very important, and I could not, you know, just uh, disregard that fact. And that's what kept me there. So when you started to commit to Formula One full-time, was it a case of, okay, I've got enough cash in the bank, I can now do what I really want to do? Exactly right. I felt that I think it's time. First of all, I was, you know, of age. You know, I was like in 35 already when I dedicated with the Parnelli, we started, it was a, that was a U.S. team, you know. But, uh, you know, with the Morris Philippe designing the car and all that, which, you know, he designed a car was three years old, actually, unfortunately. But uh, at the same time, you know, at least it was a start. And then, you know, I look back in my life. So many negatives become positives. Because the negative was that in 76, after Long Beach, unbeknownst to me, they had decided at Long Beach they were going to pull out of Formula One, the Velsparnelli Jones team. Chris Economaki, you know, the broadcaster, the announcer, came to, I was on the grid, he said, Mario, he says, uh, what's your take on the fact that uh, I was just told by Vel and Parnelli Jones that this is your last uh, Formula One race? I said, what? Can you imagine? I couldn't even find first gear, <laughs> you know, I was so upset. But the next day at the Queensway Hilton, Colin Chapman had probably the worst race of his career there at that time because he had so many distractions. He had uh, the car company, the boat company, and so forth. So, you know, the racing was not even secondary, but third dairy. <laughs> anyway, um, having breakfast by myself, and I'm looking at him. He's looking at me, so I joined him. And we both had our chins in our socks, quite honestly. And then uh, and we commiserating with one another. I said, Colin, I said, I don't have a drive that pulled out, you know. And, uh, oh, Mario says, I wish I had a decent car to give you. You know, I said, we will make that car better if you'll have me. But I need to be number one. Because any team, especially in those days, there was only one best. One best engine, one best chassis, and so forth. He says... We shook hands at that point. And, uh, and you could see, in, even in 76, the season got better and better. We got a couple of podiums, and, and the last race in, you know, in, in Japan, you say, okay, well, you won because it was rain. You know what? I was on pole in the dry. I started a race on pole in the dry. So, you know, we, we were getting there. And the comedy made after the race, I said, Mario, 
next year's car is going to make this one look like a London bus. I love, you know, I just love that energy. You know, you can imagine. So, you know, it was so golden for me to be able to be with Colin when he was resurging in the and business. And to be part of that journey yeah. with him. Yes, yes, indeed. Because if you look at uh, Colin Chapman's career with peaks and valleys, whenever he got really interested in, he usually created a world champion. You could see that. And I was part of that moment, you know, when he did that. And I told him, I said, Colin, please delegate the responsibility to someone with a car company and as a comeback racing. And uh, Hazel, his wife, said, Mario, good, good, good to go. He says, tell him that. And, uh, and so that was really the fact that he was all in then. And uh, I needed Persuaded that. Persuaded by you to commit to Formula well, One we, again. We fed from one another. We, you know, there was energy there and we all both knew what we wanted, you know, and just uh, so, you know, these are moments in your life that are so precious because they're there forever. You know, this, you look back, you figure, what if this wouldn't have happened? But let's talk about that 78 season now. How confident were you going into that season? Because you'd finished third in 1977. Did you feel that you had the momentum within Lotus to go that next step? Oh, let me tell you. Don't forget, I ran out of fuel two times leading any one of those races that I could have won. It would have been a world championship, not third. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, we had so much issue with engine situation, engine reliability. I think uh, Cosworth was trying too hard to experiment in our engines. I didn't need that. I need a reliable engine, and I paid dearly for that. Just like in Sweden, I got 36 second lead. I had to stop for fuel and didn't have, I couldn't, I tried to communicate, they didn't know what I really needed. By the time I get in, they had to go look for fuel. If they could have just poured it in, I could have even managed second even, you know, and that would have put me, that would have got a world championship points enough. I felt very confident, you know, in so many ways. You know, you always try to be realistic and so on and so forth, but I felt that, uh, you know, we had a, a, a definitely a chance of winning that championship. And how did you view the competition going into 78? There was obviously your teammate, Ronnie Peterson, but the, the Ferraris, having won the title the previous year, how seriously were you taking them? Very seriously. You can never discount that. I mean, uh, the driver combination plus the cars and the, the notorious uh, reliability of the Ferraris, you know, is, uh, is something that uh, not to discount at any time. So, um, you know, it was a question, you know, let's minimize the mistakes and, uh, and, and you know, and try to bring it home. And, and of course, like I said, I think uh, if you look at, you know, the amount of pole positions that I had, the car was, was fast. And um, by making the ground effects more efficient, you had to clean up the exit of the diffusers in the back. So we had inboard brakes on the Lotus 78, and we were, and Ronnie and I, we had brake problems every race, especially with full fuel at the start. And that's what killed me at, at the at Watkins Glen, for instance, you know, because hard on brake. And um, we had to do a lot of pumping and, and calling. You know, you know, when you come in, you know, you complain. And it's, what do you, I said, you know, you want to race, you know, in Belgium, you know, I complain. I said, Colin, I, said, I keep I pumping brakes. I said, I, and I said, the brake fluid is boiling. I said, and he said, bugger all, you know, he's going, you know, don't talk to me about that. So, so we fought that entire season, unfortunately. Uh, but that was the one weakness the car had. At the Monza, for instance, you know, where, where I, I won the race and uh, Jill Villeneuve finished second and we both got penalized for jumping the start. The whole race, I was just, I was on and on and on. But I figured if I get by him, you know, he'll get by me again because of the braking. So I just tried to save the braking right past. I had one shot going into Ascari on the last lap. And I figured this is do or die. And that's what I did. I think my, boot, my foot went right in the front <laughs> and I got by him and I won the race. Personally, I thought I, I drove the best race of my life 
and nobody knew it because we penalized. To be honest with you, I must say this, I was going to protest because uh, actually when the light went red and that was going to be green any time, just one. Uh, as soon as it went red, he went. And I reacted and I stopped. He was already in the chicane by the time green came on. And then I went on. But they, they were not going to penalize Ferrari only. <laughs> not at Monza. <laughs> not at Monza. And uh, I, think, I think we would have uh, overcome that. But it didn't make any difference in the championship, you know. But then, of course, the, the sad part was... Uh, when, you know, Ronnie's situation, there's no way we had that in us to uh, worry about, uh, you know, protesting the race and all that. It was a, it's a bigger thing to be concerned about. We'll come on to Monza a little bit later. I did just want to ask you how much of a step forward the Lotus 79 was over the Lotus 78, because it was introduced halfway through the season, wasn't it? Yes. And then you then won, I think, five in eight races once the new car had been introduced. So where was it a step forward over the old one? Aerodynamically, basically, just cleaning up uh, the uh, ground effect part by having better flow, like I told you, you know. See, the, Lo the Lotus 78 was not really born as a ground effects car. You know, when we were discussing this at Hethel, you know, at the end of the season, and everybody was just giving input, you know, and I said, you know, in 1970, when I drove the March, the March had the two pods, you know, the, the, with wing-shaped pods that were just there aesthetically. Uh, I was in South Africa testing, and because of the altitude, I figure, you know, I wonder if those pods are a frontal area issue. So we removed those, and all of a sudden the front end was flying, we had to put quite a bit more front wing, which negated everything. And uh, so I told Colin, I said, we were getting downforce, we were producing downforce from that. And those rather short pods, you know, the wing, I said, what if we go from the total wheelbase inside with the wing and then got the fence, but we had no skirts or anything, but we were getting definitely some ground effect. And then he, uh, he built a wind tunnel, you know, that uh, was a quarter scale wind tunnel. And he was getting erroneous uh, information from it. And he finally, he had to do a, a build, a moving road, a belt. Oh, all of a sudden, a whole new deal said, oh, we have something. And then we're testing at Hockenheim. And uh, at the end of the, uh, the second straighter where they connects it to straighter with the right hander, or I think it was Bosch curve. You know, it was a long right hander, and right in the middle of the curve, I was gaining considerable amount of downforce. And so I told him, I said, it's closing the thing. So he sent a mechanic in town to, to buy some. Uh, some strips. I love the way cars were developed back then. That's amazing. Yeah, Just go down to yeah. the hardware store and buy hard, some strips. Yeah, 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 some plastic strips to close that up. So I go out, oh, for two laps, wonderful. After that, you figure, well, uh, what are we going to do? Because, you know, you put the strips and obviously, you know, they wear so quickly and then you're back where you started. So that's when he put this, uh, the brushes, like. And uh, he had David Fibbs out there photographing the car, see where what's happening with the brushes at top speed. And that's when the ingenuity of Colin Chapman, he built the moving skirts. So, you know, we were gaining, and then the only thing, to answer your question half hour later, <laughs> the one thing that he wanted to, he had to do on the Lotus 79 from Lotus 78 is to just clean up the underneath, you know, clean up the exit, the diffuser. And that was the main part of it. And of course, you know, the shape of it, uh, you know, overall. But aerodynamically, just cleaned it up for, uh, you know, to get uh, less frontal area, you know. One of the things these ground effect cars in Formula One today have been suffering from, certainly more last year perhaps, but it's still a phenomenon now, is bouncing. Yes. Were you getting that back in Oh, yes, 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 yes. Yes, indeed. In fact, actually, the Lotus, the 80, came out with had quite a bit more downforce. And you had to just stiffen the car. And, of course, you had to give up some speed on the slow corners because, uh, you know, you're just uh, going to be sliding more on the slow corners. And it was a matter of just uh, 
uh, trying to figure out the balance there. But it was a whole new world all of a sudden. And I think not only us, you know, as you know, I remember Ligier, we were at Zandvoort, um, and they were porpoising all over the place. And, and that was very, very uncomfortable. Uh, but that was a phenomenon that uh, was developed after more downforce. And, and, and that's, that's where you have to find sort of the compromise. The only way that you can reduce that porpoising, making the car stiffer, stiffer. You see what I mean? And so, but then what do you do? Then you pay the price when you come at the end of the straightaway into a hairpin or whatever. And, and so uh, you could see that uh, any of the circuits where the cars, you know, basically like even uh, Mercedes were, were doing a lot of porpoising. And when you get in a circuit where you need more downforce, you know, it's, you know they, they were much more competitive. But they had to back out of it. Did you play with ride heights a lot? Oh, yeah. 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 I had a lot of little tricks, you know, on my own that... Uh, I was keeping because in those days, you know, you didn't have the computer. So I didn't have to divulge all of uh, my findings, if you will, in the setups. You know, you had to sort of be selfish to some degree, you know, if you will. And, you know, I had a very, very quick teammate, you know, with Ronnie. And, uh, and he was, they were copying me, copying all my setups, which was fine. But I was always a little bit ahead of that. And sometimes they only would copy half of it. And then I learned a long time that uh, if you're going to copy a setup, go all the way or just don't even bother. You know, so I think uh, I felt confident that I had, you know, something in my pocket there. This episode is sponsored by Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3. Captain Price and Task Force 141 return to face off against the ultimate threat in the single player campaign. Dive into multiplayer and one of the greatest collections of maps ever assembled. All 16 launch maps from the original Modern Warfare 2 have been modernised with new modes and gameplay features at launch and over 12 all-new core 6v6 maps coming in post-launch live seasons. And for the first time, team up with other squads to survive and fight massive hordes of undead in the largest Call of Duty Zombies map ever. Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3, available now. Mario, what was your greatest strength in 78, do you think? I think knowing the car really well. I think that uh, I, the car was really talking to me. What do you mean by that? I was making the slightest changes on the Ackerman. I was, and this is something that was really paying me back, even when I drove with Ferrari. I'm, that's what put me on pole from the last run that I had. I knew the corners that were really, really, you know, the key where you could actually gain the most time, give up a little bit somewhere else. But I would lengthen one side and shorten the other side. So when you arrive in a corner, like the inside wheel would open up more than the left. And when you're really in the sweet spot of the car, this is what means pole versus second place. And Colin said, why do you do that? I said, I just, I, I want to adjust the steering wheel. Were, were many other drivers doing that? Oh, I think so. I think so. I think so. I, you know, it, it's, it's something that you feel... You can't even explain it because why do you do this? For instance, uh, you know, I used to cross weight the car to benefit the quickest corners, but I would cross weight it. Actually, actually, I would increase the circumference, some stagger, even really with the radials. It staggers on one side or the other, and then still square up the car, you know, uh, with the springs. And then when mechanics would go back and they would put it on the pad, and they said, oh, and I remember one time we were at, at, in Harama. They said, oh, Mario, the car was, uh, you know, because when they put it on the pad, all the w wheels are all the same size. They said, the car was really askew, you know. He says, uh, and you were quick. And he said, we squared it up. I said, no, <laughs> no, no. So from there on, we had an understanding. I was doing a lot of little tricks like that. I come in, I come in, call, and I says, uh, uh, Two clicks up, two clicks down on, on the rear. Why do you do that? I said, just do it, you know. <laughs> you know, you say if, if you're going to copy someone else's setup, you've got to go the whole hog or not at all. 
I'm getting the impression that no one else could have driven your setup. Is that fair? No, no, they could have. Uh, when, when, it was, when the car was right, anybody would have loved it. Anybody, no question. You know, as far as the, the feel that a race driver has, when things are right, everybody recognizes that, trust me. Do you think you would have been so effective that year without Colin Chapman? I'm just talking about your relationship with him at the track side in terms of him interpreting what you wanted. You know, the best part about him, what was really, he would uh, keep my mind fertile because every time I would come in, he would throw things at me and sometimes I felt like slapping him, you know, I said, I had to, you know, because, but he, he kept me thinking and I said, oh, 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 yeah, that. But what would he throw at you? Give us an example. Let's do this. Let's do that. Let's, you know, let's increase. Let's, let's go with heavier springs in front or something like that. I said, no, 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 no. So we said, damping, damping, you know. So then they would get me thinking. I said, no, we don't want the springs. I said, maybe damping and so forth. So we had that relationship, you know, because he knew the car. He knew so much, you know. And he could almost see what I was saying, not understanding all of it. There was something special there. And, but it, because he, he was full of information in his own mind, and out of 10 suggestions, I could pick maybe one or two. Ah, ah, and I, was think, I wasn't thinking about that. You see what I mean? Other people have told me that you had the closest relationship with him since Jim Clark. Would you agree with that? Did you ever discuss things like that with him? Mm, I think it was a natural thing. I think that... Um, Quite honestly, uh, sometimes uh, I, I saw his character sometimes with, uh, I, he treated Ronnie one time, and then I was hearing everything, and he saw that I was really surprised. And he says, uh, I'm sorry you had to see that. I said, Colin, if you ever talk to me like that, I said, I don't know if I could deal with it. But he, he and I never, ever, ever had a crossword, ever. I don't know what it is, but we just somehow, I don't know, we just bonded. And, and that's the most beautiful thing, you know, about it. Because I, I felt that uh, I needed him. I really needed him so bad. And I think he, he felt that I, I got something with Mario at this point. Something that was not going to last forever, you know, because um, as the car became, uh, as you gained more downforce, you needed to have stiffness, and chassis stiffness. And that's what was happening all of a sudden, you know, like uh, the Lotus 80, for instance, was really well thought out. I mean, but it, what it was, the tub itself was the same as the 79. And uh, we had to go quite a bit stiffer, obviously. All right? And the car, in, I remember we were testing like three, four uh, laps Beautiful. I started, you know, I was one that really is using the curbing. And uh, some curves were high, you know. And once I started using the curbing, then the car, it would change from one corner to another. It was so bad. And I took so Colin, and he just, he said, he gave me a bollocking, like I said. You know, that's one thing I must say. He didn't want to hear a lot of technical thing, suggestions from a driver. <laughs> he says, Bugger out, you drive that, just drive that thing. So, but it was all in, in good nature, but he didn't want to hear some of that. So, and that's when we started sort of falling us, uh, you know, apart a little bit. You've mentioned in passing uh, Ronnie Peterson a lot. I did just want to talk about him a little bit. He won two races and finished second in the World Championship. Of course, he passed away after Monza following that start line accident. But can you start by telling us about your relationship with Ronnie and how it compared to other teammates that you'd had? Well, we had a personal relationship outside of track. You know, the families, again, uh, we both had young families, per se, and, and uh, the wives that got on, you know, Barbara and Deanne got on quite well. And, and when he would come to the States... I invite him, we go up to the lake. I mean, we crazy things, you know, like you can imagine. 
And, uh, you know, we had so much fun, you know, just uh, outside the track, you know, competing against one another, you know, playing tennis, you know. It was the same thing, you know. We're just trying to kill each other, you know. And uh, Who was better at tennis? <laughs> <laughs> he was. <laughs> it pains you to say that, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> he was better server. But, uh, you know, again, we had so much good time together and and um, after you know practice and so forth and you know we discussed things but um, he knew you know that we were not going to really go into a lot of details you know we sort of we had our own thing to do and if you get by me I says I'll I'll, I'll fight you to the end I said but uh, we were at the Zandvoort and uh, I won when I won there uh, I broke the exhaust on the right side, you know, one of the cylinders. Uh, so obviously you lose some power, but also it burnt the, uh, the lower body work. So I lost the flow on the, on the right bank. And, uh, and especially the corner coming onto the straightaway, the diffuser, the diffuser was coming apart because fiberglass, you know, so it burned. And, um, and he was, you know, he was coming outside and I would just chop him, you know. He says, he says, why, what did, you know, what did you chop me so bad? I said, oh, it was up to you. I said, to just get alongside me earlier, you know. He says, well, you know, I said, hey, when we were out there, we were out there for blood, man. <laughs> you know, I said, <laughs> no favors. How quick was he? Ronnie was, had a natural feel, the car, to get extract out of the car. He, he was not to really go for the slight, for the smallest detail to really understand you know the sweet spot of the car he was trying to overcome that with his ability you know with his skill and he he could drive the car sideways like no other there's a wonderful photograph of him completely sideways yeah. through woodcut at silverstone which yeah. back then was 170 mile an hour yeah. corner, wasn't it yes but that was his style is that what you're saying yeah that was style and uh it was awesome i mean it was uh he had something to offer for sure, you know, but, uh, and I had tremendous respect for him, believe me. So how do you reflect on Monza? Because it was on paper meant to be the happiest day of your life, something that you'd been building up to winning the world championship. But of course, that huge shadow of Ronnie's death. I said this so many times, you know, that uh, should have been the happiest day of my career for sure, which was somewhere I could not celebrate. How could I celebrate? I lost one, one of my best friends, and uh, I could not believe that I lost him because uh, I, I walked up to the accident, and um, you, you could tell that he was in shock and so forth, you know, but he was alive. He was alive. He, I figured, okay, he's going to have a problem with his leg, going to be limping for a few months, but uh, he's alive. So I, I was felt okay. Next day, driving to the hospital, I got off the Autostrada, and um, where I was paying the toll, the gentleman says, uh, he recognized me, he says, uh, did you hear? I said, no. He said, put the radio on. He says, Ronnie Peters should just die. I said, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. I just could not believe that. And um, so, and this is another area where we kept fighting to just, uh, uh, we didn't have the best uh, medical attention, you know, in, in situations like this. Because, you know, traveling different countries and so on and so forth, uh, you had to go with the locals. And, um, and we had to sort of devise something that uh, could be trustworthy, one individual that could control this and go to the locals and, and choose the best possible situation, just in case. You know, it was, uh, the, the safety aspect it was a work in progress. It took a long time, but it started. We were getting smarter than that. And then, you know, talking to Nicky Lauda, talking to Jackie Stewart, they got it. And I said, we have to take this on ourselves. I said, because nobody will do it. I said, when it comes down to any safety feature in a race car, Usually, it's a performance penalty, whether it's aerodynamic or weight. 
Nobody, there's no engineer on this planet that's going to say, oh, yeah, let's do this, even though it's a little bit of a problem because we like the driver. No. has to be part of the rules. has to be, you know, become that. And, um, and so it was, like I said, no process. But look what we have today, though, you know. How did you compartmentalize the dangers? How did you, did you take a chip out of your brain every time you got in the car? Is that how you justified what you were doing? I had a way of, I just said to myself, never, I could not dwell on that aspect of it. I mean, I lost my best friend in uh, uh, Riverside, you know, Billy Foss, we were rooming together, and I'm out there to qualify right after he was killed in turn nine. I mean, how was that? You, you see what I mean? That we had these It makes moments. you sound very callous. I know, I know, I know it is, but... I, if I would, would have dwelled on that, you know, I would have quit a long, long time ago. And I mean, and quite honestly, we never discussed it, you know, like even as a family, my wife just understood me. She knew, she knew me. And, uh, and I knew what she was thinking all along. But, but again, uh, that was never part of the conversation because it was there. The danger was there. But if you're going to dwell on that, then you just start doing something else. You just don't belong. And somehow, I don't know why, I would just, uh, and that's it. That, that was my nature. I wanted this so bad. I figure I could not believe me doing anything else in my, with my life, professional life and being happy and being satisfied. And so I was selfish, but at the same time, I was willing to take the, the risk. Uh, sometimes I feel guilty, quite honestly. Why was I spared? Why was I spared so much? And uh, but uh, do I take it for granted? No, I count my blessings every day. Trust me. And three weeks after Monza, you go and set a new lap record on your way to pole position at Watkins Glen. Yeah. Well, like I said, it's a figure. You know, Ronnie is up there smiling. He would have done the same. That's the only way to do, the only way to think. I often, that's, that was my way of uh, dealing with it. I don't think I was disrespectful in any way because I felt that um, there's something inside of us that I felt he would have been thinking, my friends would have been thinking the same thing, the same way. And I said, he's up there smiling. I said, go for it, man. This episode is sponsored by Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3. Purchase the Vault Edition of Modern Warfare 3 to get exclusive content including the Nemesis Operator Pack, Fate Weapon Vaults, the Season 1 Black Cell Bundle with 50 tier skips, and the Soul Harvester Weapon Blueprint. Experience thrilling gameplay across campaign, multiplayer and zombies and get instant access to the Soap Operator Pack and Zombie Ghost Operator Skin. Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3. Available now. So you win the world championship in 78. How did it change your life? It changed my life forever in the best possible way because just is something that, that's repeated. And uh, when I hear it, it's all sweet memories. And whenever things are not going so well, maybe that's where I think, look, I'm lucky I've been there. Look, I, so I said, don't give me this crap now that you're down on now. You know, you don't. Did you have a good party with Colin? We did. Uh, eventually, obviously, you know, we all did, you know, but um, it took a while. It took a while to do that, to, to be able to loosen up. Mario, you know how you asked Colin to focus on racing. Yes. I'll come, we'll work together, but I want you to focus on racing. Leave the park, the car company, and all the other things you've got going on just for now. How did he deal with the fact that you weren't solely focused on Formula One? Even in that championship winning year, you did, I think, eight IndyCar races. You did 24 transatlantic crossings. You know, it's a, that's a good question because uh, actually... You know, all my the racing contracts I did by myself. I had a business manager, you know, way, way. Actually, uh, Jim Clark and I had 
the, the fir- I had the first bit of business manager that he had as well. And, um, and, but, but as far as racing contracts, I did it all myself because I said, nobody can know what I want. But every contract had a clause that said, if, you know, you, you, they own, every contract, they feel they own you. And, and I just let it go. And I'll give you for instance. We're at Silverstone. We're testing. And it's a free weekend in Formula coming up. And, of course, um, I'm racing for Roger Bensky in Indy cars. And uh, so it was a Wednesday. And, oh, Mario, are you staying in Europe? Uh, and uh, I said, no, no, Colin, I'm going back. I said, I'm, I'm, I'm driving this weekend. Mario, you can't do that. I said, I know. I said, but I will. And... and I said, okay, fire me. You know, I went through this even in the States, you know, with Pat Patrick. You know, I was even, you know, the last race that I did uh, for Ferrari at uh, in Monza in 82, I was contracted. Pat Patrick he says, oh, you, can, you, can, you can't do that. I said, well, you know, I said, but I will. And I said, there's no one on this planet that was going to control my destiny in the sport. No one. Now, Always kept in mind, I said, uh, don't conflict the sponsors, respect all of that, and always be there when you're called for. I never miss a test or anything else, you know, because I knew what my main effort was. The other was a sideline. And um, I said, that's up to me to do it. I said, uh, you don't know whether I'm on the beach somewhere, you know, at the Rone Riviera, or whether I'm in Michigan, you know, driving a 200 mile race or something, you know, and uh, doesn't matter. So, did tiredness come into it though? If you've just done a 200 mile oval race at Michigan, were you jaded when you turned up for the next Grand Prix? No, 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 no. I had to look. I had to look at myself in a mirror. In fact, as a matter of fact, that was the best thing. Because you're, you know, you're always on it. I mean, sometimes if you're out of the race car for two weeks or whatever, it takes you a couple of laps to just, you know, the G-forces or whatever. But when you do it all the time, you're on it. No, no, that was the best thing physically for me because I love, you know, a race like uh, it would be really hot. I think psychologically, I felt I can deal with this better than anybody. I'm in good shape, you know, and... Maybe not, but you, you feel good about feeling that way, you know. So I, mean, I think the the part, the physical side, because a lot of, you know, many times some of the owners, you know, look at me, oh, you know, he's, he's not that big, you know, this, don't worry. As long as I don't have to put the race car on my shoulders, I'm okay. And what about jet lag, though? Did you suffer from that? No, you know, I'm a really a good traveler. I really, really am. That's a blessing. Yeah. I uh, always said, I remember, you know, we'd be in Argentina or whatever, and uh, Colin was always, you know, he says, he looked, oh, my goodness, you know, in England, this time. Every time, whatever I went, the first thing I always did, I went on local time. And you have to deal with that. I sleep well, like on a plane, I could always, uh, and you know that uh, when I was called down at, to test in Monza, it was a weekend before the race uh, in 1982, and uh, it was uh, agreed that I would test there on Sunday primarily, the, the week before. And I arrived there on Saturday, Saturday morning. Well, actually, a Saturday morning in Milano. Drove to Maranello, and we had lunch at uh, Cavallino and, uh, with Mr. Ferrari. And then we went to Fiorano to get fitted up in the car and so forth. Then I said, um, I'd like to do a few laps and make sure... And then I said, you know, I'd like to continue. Then he called, you know, all the safety and so on and so forth. I ran 87 laps that day and set a track record that lasted eight years. Having just got off a plane. And got off the plane all night, flying all night. And then, you know what, the next day, I gave the mechanics day off. And Deanne and I were on, on a Moto Guzzi. We took a, a drive up the Abitone Pass. You know, and we we found rain also, but <laughs> and by going by, and it's, it's there were some people actually that they had the tents up and everything else because they expected us to, to test <laughs> the track, and we drove by and we 
And uh, because I said, I'm, I'm fine with the car. I don't need to do any more, you know. But uh, the point is the adrenaline. When the adrenaline is there, you know, you just can do it. One more thing just about dovetailing those two programs in 78. I mean, I'm sure Ro- Roger Penske loves Formula One. So I'm sure he was as understanding as he could have been. But did you for a second think this is my best shot of winning the Formula One World Championship. What happens if I injure myself in an IndyCar? Like I told you, I never dwelled on that aspect. I never dwelled on that because I never dwelled on the fact that, okay, I'm not going to do this because I might get injured. I just, I have to, I had to do what I had to do. That's what kept me going, quite honestly. Uh, and, and that was my religion. That's it. I did also want to ask you about the driving talent in 78. It was a vintage year for Formula One because there were eight world champions or future world champions on the grid. I'm thinking you, Lauda, Schechter, Fittipaldi, Jones, Hunt, Piquet and Rosberg. That is a hell of a bunch of drivers. And then, of course, you've got people like Ronnie and Gilles Villeneuve, Patrick Depaillet, Didier Peroni. They were all on the grid as well. Did you ever race on such a quality grid elsewhere in your career? When I look back at the, some of the grid, that we said, oh, my goodness, you know, you know, that was interesting. And that's why, you know, people ask me, I say, who was your really your toughest competitor? I mean, there were many. There were many. That's when I, that's when I look back. I say, how fortunate was I to be on the same track, doing the same thing with drivers like that, with that caliber of drivers and that's what makes you work harder makes you you need that because that's what really gives you all the energy in the world that you need to try to just improve your skills do whatever it takes watch what they're doing and again and then the ultimate satisfaction is to be able to win over someone like that you know when you win the premium of that win who finished a second? No question about it. And that's, that's what it is. I mean, we all think the same. You were clearly a hell of a competitor. So was it the lure of success, as you've just described it, or was it a fear of failure that drove you on? Well, me was the lure of success because, I tell you that, at the beginning, our very first race that Aldo and I did, we built our own car. It was a 1959. And I mean, I, I, that's a story in itself. You know, we did a good job only because the friends that we had around, we had one geek, you know, geek that knew all the right things. And we did the right job. Uh, we bought, you know, information from one of the top teams in NASCAR and so on. Aldo won the first race because, you know, we had to toss up. I won the second race, which was my first race. After you do that, winning is the only thing. Unfortunately, I give up more than one race by making a mistake, by not being okay with second or third, by just really forcing the issue. That's the only thing, if I have any regrets, to look back, I say, you dodo, you know, because I was so infatuated with just winning. That's why I have some special appreciation for some of the drivers, even today, you know, that like uh, uh, Fernando Alonso, for instance. And, you know, I, I look at this man as he loves what he's doing. He, he even gave up Formula One for a year. He took a sabbatical. I think, oh my goodness, you know, uh, when he goes back, he'll have the toughest time. No, he picked it right back up. There's something inside, you know. This He's desire, a lion, isn't he? The desire, the desire that gets you there. And what does that do? And did for you, you have that same desire? You damn Clearly. right. Oh, I never lacked desire. I never lacked desire. Yeah, passion and desire. That's one thing that I know. That's what drove me. Now you don't want to single out any drivers that stood out in that 78 season. You've said that already, but could you just give us a handful of guys that you really respected? <laughs> Name it. Name them. I mean, it's, uh, uh, look at the feel that we had. I mean, I don't want to name because I'm going to leave somebody out, you know, but the, you look at the quality of feel that we had, you know, with Ferrari 
nipping at your heels right there. And, you know, that uh, the Williams, uh, you know, you know, actually, uh, Williams, that's when they really started coming alive, you know, with that, uh, they, they actually did a better job than we, than we did uh, a stiffer car. They were the first one with carbon uh, underside uh, for the diffuser where there was no, no flexing, you know. You know, you had drivers that, um, th there was always some, somebody that stood out. I mean, somebody, there was a fight. There was, you know, and there was, I never felt, oh, okay, I got him handled and so on and so forth. Never felt that way. I, I looked at everyone as that possibility, you know, that I got to be able to. How much did you study your rivals back then? Would you look at videos of what they were doing, how they drove? The best thing when you're behind them. When you're behind them, I, I learned something like some of the apexes for Mellon Jones. You know, I said, Oh, I'm missing something. And then I started working because it was not really my style to do the late apex like that because of the ovals. And I started picking that up and I really I improved my situation by looking at, you know, and always look at somebody, Oh, what is he doing? I'm not doing that. And it's, oh, then I got to try it. And, ooh, you know, it might be bad. You always, you always, you got to be out there. You know, somebody that's in front of you, they're in front of you for a reason. You know, at that particular time, at that particular moment, there's always something that you learn. And I tell you what, it's, you never have it all. I mean, never feel, oh, yeah, I, got, I have it handled now. There's always some until I think I probably learned something to the very last race of my life. So when you look at the current grid, who stands out? Who has the qualities that you think are important in racing? Well, right now, you, you got to look at the very top at the moment, you know, and um, I think uh, I'm looking at Max. What uh, he just under any circumstance, I mean, he'll just Go on, no matter what, I mean, he, he's gonna, he, you know, we, we watched like uh, Singapore. I mean, he fought to the end, you know, with what he had and so forth. That's the spirit. And he learned something even from that, and he put it to the good for the following race and so on and so forth. But the spirit is there, confidence, super confidence. I mean, and Lewis, I see a resurgence of Lewis as far as a fight. The fight that's in him, you know, even this last, okay, there was a mistake. At this time. He was going for that lead no matter what. And he, he, at that point, he thought, well, and my teammate is going to back off. Well, the teammate had the same thought, you know what I mean? But I like that. I like that kind of a drive. At this stage of their career, you know, it's still there. So that's what you look forward, you know, into and, and watching. Look at McLaren all of a sudden. Who would have thought that Piastri is a rookie all of a sudden? You see what I mean? That's the beauty of it. Are you excited by Piastri? Yes, absolutely I am. Yeah, because, you know, you could see under, I mean, really trying pressure circumstances, he looked good. Vegas is just around the corner. It's a huge moment for Formula One to be going back to Las Vegas. Of course, you raced there back in the day in the Caesars Palace car park. What do you remember of that version of Las Vegas? Well, I remember we were getting tremendous amount of vibration <laughs> coming out of the corner because there was so much first gear driving through there that uh, uh, both years with the Formula One, I had uh, the suspension fill. I had a wishbone breaking in the, in the back because, and I, I kept saying, I don't know. I mean, you have to be on throttle. In those times, you know, we had the turbo engines that were like a switch, on or off. When the power came on, all of a sudden you had the 900 horsepower. You know, that <laughs> you, you only needed about maybe 650 at that point. And uh, so anyway, and I was, you know, trying to be really aggressive. And anyway, pay the press. But the point is, that track, you know, at the Caesars Palace at the time was a wonderful go-kart track. Not for Formula One. And that's why it only lasted two years. But then they ran two more years. They sort of modified it somewhat. Two more years of Indy cars, and I finished first or second there, actually. So, um, yeah, I have great memories of that. But now, my goodness, I mean, it's... Uh, the beauty about what's happening now is that there's uh, 
true, true investment on the paddock area and everything else, which is there. I mean, it's uh, it's not something that you put up tent, you know, after the weekend is over and, and everything is back to normal. No. I mean, that infrastructure remains. And when you have that type of investment, then you know you have a future, no question. And, and it's beautiful. I mean, the interest that, that we see for Vegas coming on, it's just unbelievable. And having three races in the States. In the States, yes. I mean, Do you feel that Formula One has got traction here now that it's never had before oh absolutely i can see just the press i mean i was watching tv like uh, the weatherman last night he's trying to be expert explaining here just uh, what the weather how it's go- the wind is going to affect the big straightaway here you know and so forth yeah, they're all in it they're all in it Isn't that beautiful that's gorgeous that's beautiful to see the ambiance that uh, you're going to have in Las Vegas, that's going to be a spectacle of its own. You know, it just uh, looks like when you go to Singapore. I mean, it's just unbelievable at night. So it's probably the first time that I'll stay up all night watching the Formula One race. Will you be in Vegas? Yeah, of course. Yeah. 10 p.m. start. It's going to be cold as well, I think. Cold, yeah. No, it's good. I mean, drivers will love it. Mario, thank you very much. An hour spent with Mario is always time well spent, and I'm amazed at how clearly he remembers his racing days. For all the interviews he's done over the last 45 years, he said things here that I've never previously heard him say. He lobbied like crazy to get more road races put onto the IndyCar schedule because he knew it would help his preparations for being a Grand Prix driver. That was new as was picking up late apexes from Alan Jones after following the Aussie in a race. That was new, as were many other comments he made in this chat. And it was great to hear how excited he is about this weekend's Las Vegas Grand Prix. Mario says the drivers will love it, which is exciting for them and for us. Mario, thank you for your time as ever, and I look forward to seeing you in Vegas this weekend. Well, what did you think of what Mario said? For the older fans among you, what memories do you have of his 1978 world title success? And for the younger ones, have you watched any films about Mario on YouTube? And if you haven't, I strongly recommend that you do. Please let me know your thoughts on everything Mario via all the usual means. I'm at Tom Clarkson F1 on X, or you can use the hashtag F1 Beyond the Grid. Which brings us on to what you sent in after last week's show with Pierre Gasly. It had been five years since we'd last heard from Pierre on the pod, And he didn't disappoint, did he? Let's start with this from DNF Despair. The image of Pierre sitting on the podium after his win is one full of emotion. I loved hearing how it was Antoine's dream to be an F1 driver with Alpine. What a beautiful way to honor his friend's memory. And I hope to see Pierre secure a victory with the team. Well, will that come in 2024, DNF? And thank you very much for the note. What about this from Ryan? One of my favourite episodes this year. Thank you, Ryan. Pierre is such a lovely driver to listen to and he comes across as a true gent. I still find it amazing that he once replied to me on Instagram. I feel like there will be more wins in the future. Pierre is a lovely guy, Ryan, and he takes nothing for granted, including his fan base from the sounds of it. Thank you very much for the message. And what about this from Alpine employee Amit Mandalia? I knew this interview was coming last week. I'm enjoying listening today and have something in common with Pierre in that both of us joined this team in 2023. We'll have to tell Pierre this when I get a chance to see him at Enstone. Yes, Amit, tell him. And that's what the Christmas party's for, surely. Great to hear from you again, by the way. And we'll end these messages with a note from Robert de Jong. Love the pod. Pierre is such a great guy. You hear him light up telling the stories with Yuki. They really are good friends, and it's a shame that he isn't driving for a bigger team. Thanks for the message, Robert. And with the budget cap, I don't think Alpine lacks the opportunity to compete with the big teams. Let's see what happens in the next few years. But I think he can win with Alpine. Well, we'll leave it there for messages this week. Thank you to everyone who wrote in. And please remember to give me your thoughts and stories about Mario Andretti in time for next week's show. And why not check out the Beyond the Grid back catalogue for more conversations with Formula One legends like Mario. We get a lot of messages saying our archive is helping people learn about the history of the sport, which is brilliant. 
So that's almost it for this week. As we've already said, Formula One is heading back to Las Vegas for the first time since 1982. And you can get ready for what promises to be a spectacular race by listening to F1 Nation's preview, which is out now. And we'll have the last word on the weekend's action in our race review next week as well. Just search your podcast app for F1 Nation. Thank you, as ever, for listening. F1 Beyond the Grid is produced by Formula One and Audio Boom Studios. Until next time, keep it flat out.